Welcome to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset, the leading data and analytics company for the cannabis industry. Welcome to the High Rise, where we talk all things cannabis, USMSOs, Canadian LPs, products and market analysis through the lens of data. And my name is Cy Scott with Headset. I'm joined, as always, by Emily Paxia Poseidon. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the High Rise. And today we've got a very special guest, Jason Wild of JW Asset Management, also executive chairman of Terrasend, uh, the fund's largest position. Welcome, Jason. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Nice to uh, nice to be here with you guys. So awesome. Yeah, really. Ex- <laughs> yeah, really exciting. This is our first time trying a Twitter Spaces. If you're listening to this on the podcast, uh, we're experimenting a bit with Twitter Spaces to see, uh, you know, what this looks like with a kind of a live audience here. So kind of a different different channel for us but bear with us but i'm pretty excited to to kind of see how this is going to work why don't uh we start jason uh if you could just introduce yourself to maybe some of our listeners that aren't that familiar with your background sure so i am uh, originally a pharmacist practiced uh, for about a year uh but was more into the uh, stock markets so opened up a pharmaceutical focused uh, hedge fund back in 1998 with about 80 grand under management we uh, did almost all, all pharmaceutical investing up until around 2015, uh, publics and privates. Uh, and in 2015, I got a call from a banker up in Canada raising money for one of these new medical cannabis operators. I thought it was uh, super interesting. I was always a fan of cannabis, but never knew that I could uh, you know, uh, participate in it as a, as a legal business. Went up to Canada, met with that company, really got bitten by the bug and realized that this was going to be a huge opportunity and I was sort of souring a little bit on regular regular pharma. So we pretty much pivoted the fund over the next uh, couple of years, pretty much completely to uh, cannabis. In the beginning, we were only in Canada because I was actually worried about getting arrested in terms of being <laughs> here in New York. And uh, towards the end of 17, we made a uh, large, or my fund let, let a large investment into a company called uh, Terrasend. I became the chairman. About six months later, we pivoted TerraSend into the U.S. It was when uh, when John Boehner went on the board of Acreage. I said, "Screw it, nobody's getting arrested." You know, <laughs> there's a lot more rich and powerful people than me involved in the industry. So we pivoted TerraSend into the U.S. I believe we're really the only Canadian LP that pivoted into the uh, into the U.S. We did that, and our first uh, entry was uh, the Apothecarium Dispensary chain in Northern California, uh, also State Flower. Which is a cultivation, which is a flower brand in California, and uh, Valhalla, an edibles brand. And then uh, the next year, we did uh, we bought a company called Ilera in uh, Pennsylvania, one of the top operators uh, in the Pennsylvania market. And also uh, around the same time, we applied for a license in New Jersey and won one. You know, we didn't know at the time that rec was that rec was coming, but uh, we won that license back in eighteen and stood up the operations uh, about a year and a half ago. And at this point, about 50 or so percent of my fund is in, uh, is in TerraSend, but we also do invest in other cannabis companies and uh, as well as just regular healthcare companies too. Yeah, we're so excited to have you on today, Jason. And um, yeah, as Sai mentioned, this is our first Twitter Spaces. We're going to do a few of these where, when we have special guests on that we think it'd be fun to have the live capture of this so folks can tune in and felt like a fun Friday activity. But I was really excited to have you on because of your experience both in investing and then moving into the operational space. So I'm I'm very excited to hear your perspectives about different things that you've experienced and and I also think you've had a really interesting lens on retail brands and how you've approached that, both in terms of the apothecarium and as we'll talk about soon, um, Gage. But I'll let I'll let Sai jump in. But thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Um... Just look, guys, I've got quite a bit going on, uh, <laughs> a lot of different irons in the fire. So kind of looking at last year, I mean, we're at the beginning here of 2022, looking at last year with all that going on, you know, what are some of your highlights or even lowlights for you, for the industry? You know, what do you think about when you look back at last year? Yes. So um, I guess uh, there's been, uh, there were highlights and, uh, and lowlights uh, as well. You know, I would say for Terror Center, for, for, for the industry in general, I mean, obviously, uh, the stocks, we had a sort of gangbusters uh, 2020, you know, the whole sector was uh, was pretty strong. And then we went into the beginning of the year and we had the Senate flip and everybody uh, we brought in a lot of new investor, a lot of new uh, institutional investors. And they thought that legalization or safe or something U.S. listing was happening, 
you know, uh, going to be happening imminently. And then, uh, as most of the people on this uh, spaces re- know, at this point, it didn't happen. So that was, I think, the first sort of low light. You know, uh, at some point in February, the sector peaked. And then we had a lot of institutionals exiting over the following uh, 10 months or so. And what happened, I think, is you had that. And that's, you know, uh, in, in a sector that, that doesn't participate necessarily where our stocks are not necessarily in a real market or in a more liquid uh, market like, you know, the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. You end up having uh, bigger moves in one direction or, or the other. In this case, it was uh, it was to the downside. What happened, I would say, you know, from a TerraSend perspective is, you know, had some of our uh, own issues come the spring with a lo- very large scale expansion that we were doing in Pennsylvania, you know, came out and told everybody that over, over the summer, we made it clear or we told everybody that we were going to be sort of uh, taking our medicine here, running that facility, not for pushing out quantity, even though we did have the largest uh, market share. But we related to the expansion and the issues that came up around that we were going to be uh, uh, running that facility for you know, for quality, uh, even if it meant killing you know hundreds or thousands of plants. Because my view was that if we didn't get everything right, then we could still be you know limping along uh, a year or two years later. So we decided to take a decisive action, and uh, many people who know me you know know that like I. You know, uh, I like to really only think of the long term. And, you know, we use this term about being long term greedy, which really means like, you know, which we are not greedy. I would I would always rather make uh, three dollars, you know, a year from now or two dollars a year from now than try to grab a dollar right now. So that's sort of, uh, you you know, uh, maybe a low light that turned into a highlight with the benefit now of uh, being, uh, you know, six or seven months later. I'm happy to say that. Our measures that we took there in PA have really worked out, you know, even better than expected. And we are currently growing and producing and selling by far the best flower that we've uh, that we've ever grown there. And it's not just uh, from a sort of a qualitative perspective, but but, uh, you know, from a real measurement in terms of THC levels are the highest we've ever uh, we've ever grown. Terpene levels are the highest, all of those things. And I guess back to sort of the low light of the industry is. Sometime around June or May or June, most of the markets, and Sai, you know, because you guys are uh, very close to the data, the market started flattening out. That extreme or accelerated month over month growth that the whole industry uh, was enjoying for, you know, the year and a half, uh, uh, roughly, of COVID, it started to uh, slow down or flatten out because people were now, you know, going back out of the house, going back to work spending money on different things like, you know, dinners and all the things that they that they hadn't done during COVID. And that sort of served to flatten the growth. And I would say in, in most states, you know, side, so uh, you know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. As it related to Pennsylvania, it did things right around when we decided to take our decisive actions. Things got a little bit more competitive in Pennsylvania. There was more uh, capacity that came online. And, you know, all I can say is thank God that we made the changes that we did. Because a lot of people are complaining about competitiveness in, in PA at this point, but our flower is, uh, you know, so much better than it was. And I think, you know, really now is uh, sort of uh, at the top of the market. You know, it confirmed my view that uh, the best product wins, that it's not necessarily about branding or packaging or endorsements or anything like that. It's really if you grow the highest quality flower then customers are going to want to buy it uh, even even in a more competitive market. So that worked out, uh, you know, w- you know, well for us in terms of uh, this, uh, you know, sort of struggle that we had uh, in PA ended up uh, turning into a, uh, a positive because it really got us uh, in gear and much better situated to be able to uh, supply a, a market or the market as it got a, as it got a little bit more competitive. And my view is. All of these markets are going to get more competitive, and especially in these limited uh, licensed states, you know, uh, my view is that whoever are the market leaders in those states, we shouldn't look at it as where that uh, that market share was necessarily gained because, you know, people were always choosing those products. Often in these limited licensed states, people are choosing the products that are available, and when product becomes more available in the market, they might not still be choosing those same products. And, and I wanted to make sure that we were going to be able to uh, segue and still succeed in a market that was, uh, was, that was better supplied. 
So that that sort of PA and a low light that hopefully uh, you can see uh, t- turns into sort of a highlight. But overall, you know, the market growth uh, across the country slowed some, uh, you know, still growing year over year, but that sequential monthly, monthly growth, you know, sort of flattened out. Uh, we have seen in recent months, I would say in December, we've, we're, we've seen in multiple states that I've, where I've seen the data that the growth has started again. And we knew that it, wa- that it would. It was just a matter of sort of digesting these very large, you know, accelerated gains that we had experienced for, for a year and a half. But I never for a second thought that because people were going back out of their houses, that all of a sudden cannabis uh, was no longer a, a growth industry. So we have seen that in the last few months. And I think that overall, you know, uh, it's been, you know, this sort of, uh, you know, extra competitiveness or slow down. I think it's been good for the industry in a lot of ways because, you know, it's making it so that companies are separating themselves now. And the companies that can really compete and are good operators, they're going to continue to do well. But maybe the, you know, maybe the ones that, uh, you know, we're sort of faking it a little bit or we're succeeding for, you know, not necessarily the, the best reasons. Those those companies, I feel like, are going to be have either been exposed or are going to be exposed. It's like, uh, you know, the Warren Buffett quote about, uh, you know, uh, you don't know who's swimming without their uh, bathing suit on until the uh, until the tide goes out. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's, yeah, that's yeah. The truth. All, all good points. And you're spot on uh, on the data, uh, for sure. I think, you know, early Q4, tail end of Q3, things were slowing down um, quite a bit, but we saw, you know, good December numbers coming out. So I think that that's a good sign. Uh, we'll see if that trend continues into into January. It's, it's a really strange world we're in with this Omicron stuff things, these fits and starts, you know, kind of back to, to the day to day and all of a sudden we're not. And so it's a hard thing to predict, uh, but it was really nice to see those numbers come in, you know, higher in, in December. And, and you're right. It's like this is this industry is not going anywhere. It's going to continue to grow. Uh, you know, when we look at, you know, year over year growth rates, it's really hard to even compare against 2020 because you had these huge spikes, you know, the beginning of the pandemic. So yeah. you know, we'll see. We'll see how that all shakes out. But I also like your outlook on, on just long term. Right. I mean, that's that's this industry. You really have to to think long term. Sometimes you know, there's, there's the joke, like cannabis years, like dog years, you know, every year feels like so much happens, but sometimes, you know, it's like stuff doesn't happen fast enough. And I think we're going to talk about that as we dig into some of these, uh, you know, new markets coming online, but having that long-term outlook is, I think is really paramount in this industry. So you kind of talked about, you know, some of what you expect kind of happening this year, you know, on the, on the growth side, data side, anything else like 2022 uh, that you're excited about kind of after looking back at 21, do you think uh, these new markets are going to, you know, change the dynamic quite a bit? Do you think we're going to see more stabilization, any other sort of prediction for this year? Absolutely. And let me just, I just want to back up. I did leave out a couple of other highlights for 22, at least as they related to Terrasen. We, um, you know, negotiated and signed a deal with Gage Cannabis, one of the leading operators in Michigan. Super, super excited about that, and hopefully that deal will be uh, will be closing pretty soon. In addition, we um, stood up pretty much uh, fully stood up our uh, large uh, indoor facility in New Jersey. The indoor facility, I think, uh, started right around January first, and we've uh, really dialed in the flower that's coming out of that out of that facility and we think we have you know amongst the best uh, products in in new jersey and we have two dispensaries that we opened uh, and we'll be opening up our third in, uh, dispensary in in new jersey in, in the coming days we're definitely excited about that aspect of the of the business as well going forward into 2022 i mean you know jersey uh, uh should be turning on for adult use don't ask me specifically when i mean by law it's supposed to start on uh, February 22nd, but I think that, you know, based upon uh, the communication or the lack of communication we're getting from the state in relation to that, I would not be surprised to see that uh, drag on some, some more time past past February 22. But that is going to be, for Terrasen, that's going to be a huge opportunity because we don't have as wide of a footprint as a lot of the other operators in the space do. So it really has the ability, New Jersey in and of itself has the ability to be pretty quickly much larger than the whole rest of our business. So we're really excited about that. We're ready. We've got, you know, uh, almost 4,000 pounds of flour sitting in the vault. We've got our stores ready and we're just, we're waiting for the go ahead on that. In terms of other other things, uh, 
for uh, for Terrasan. I'm really excited. It takes a long time when you make changes in a facility like we did over the summer in PA. It just the life cycle of the plant and how long it takes to hit the market and all that. We first started to see our brand new product coming, you know, towards the end of the fourth quarter. But we will be will really start seeing that full strength in uh, in 2022. Something else that I'm excited about is. We always felt like we could get back to our old, uh, sh- our original uh, share, which was which was pretty large in in Pennsylvania. But the one thing that we felt like could be holding us back was that we didn't have new genetics. Pennsylvania is very strict in terms of when they let you bring in genetics. You were only allowed to bring them in like when you first got your license. So our genetics in PA were sort a little bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the older and less new side, and. The real cannabis connoisseurs, they love new strains and new genetics and all that. And we weren't going to be able to offer them that. And that was the one thing that we felt like could keep us from maybe even achieving more share than we, uh, than we originally had. Well, the good news there is on December 1st of last year, the state opened up the genetics window. And you should assume that sometime in the you know, second quarter of this year, our menu of products will go from, you know, say, not necessarily the newest and, uh, and most desirable genetics to we feel like we're going to have amongst, uh, you know, uh, the best genetics uh, in the state. And that includes, uh, you know, being able to launch gauge uh, strains uh, in addition to some some other brands. So it's really coming together really well for us there. And, and we're very excited to uh, to sort of uh, show the the street and our investors uh, how much uh, success we're going to have there in uh, in Pennsylvania. In terms of the uh, in terms of the overall industry, uh, I think that uh, as we discussed, we're, we're going to be back in our in you know higher growth stage across uh, almost all of these all of these states, and I think that uh you know the the street uh, has and these stock prices have acted like uh, these companies are never going to grow again. They're sort of being treated or the multiples that a lot of these stocks are trading at. It's as if they're uh, you know not growth stocks, and that is just not the case. These are. Uh, you know, uh, these are amongst the best, best growth stories in a, uh, you know, in a stock market that doesn't have a whole lot of real, you know, organic growth at this point. So I think that that is going to uh, recalibrate. And even if it doesn't, so many of these companies, even if they kept the same multiple, their uh, profitability should increase so much over the next couple of years. And there are so many very accretive acquisitions out there where, you can buy assets, you know, sort of the definition of being creative to earnings is being able to buy them at lower, buy assets at lower multiples than where you're trading. So even if the multiples stay the same, uh, I believe that uh, many of these companies' uh, stock prices should work because the uh, profitability is going to increase substantially. That's sort of, uh, you know, I, in terms of other thoughts on 2022, I think uh, people and uh, the investors uh, uh, and management companies at these different uh, operators, they're realizing now sort of the best products win, the highest quality products win. And you're not going to be able to get away with, you know, selling shitty weed anymore and just being able to sell it because the market will take whatever you can sell, especially in these limited licensed states where now there's more capacity coming on. And to me, like I said, that's a good thing. Like, uh, you know, that like we want to compete that this is part of what I admire about, uh, about the gauge folks uh, is like they they're not afraid of competition. They don't get upset when there's more licenses coming online. They're sort of like you know bring it on. Like we're uh, we're ready to compete and we're and we're ready to show everybody how good we are. You know even relative to uh, you know all of our other uh, all of our other competitors. You know and I think that that is really to me it's more about in, in everywhere where we operate we need to be you know pretty much singularly focused on our customers and our patients. You know, if you pay too much attention to your competitors, then you become more like your competitors. And if we are completely focused on our customers and patients and every day trying to figure out what we can do to better provide them with the products that they're going to want, then, you know, I think we're going to be uh, pretty, pretty tough to beat. And, you know, and other companies that, uh, that follow that, that same sort of mantra are going to, are going to do well as well. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. You know, there's, I definitely want to talk about New Jersey, but you're talking about Gage there and, and some of the genetic stuff. So quick question on the genetics window in Pennsylvania. Will that remain open? Can you guys keep innovating on genetics or is it a is it like a tight window and they close it again? It's shut. It's shut. 
It was the first to the th to the thirty first. But I did hear this morning somebody told me that they are going to open up another genetics window, a twenty four hour genetics window at some point <laughs> over the next several months. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting. It's uh, very different than than a lot of places. Yeah. Um, on on Gage, uh, you know, you mentioned you know competition and now performing. You know, I remember with kind of the early announcement. You know, Gage talking about you know outperforming the the competition in the market as far as like larger basket sizes than what is like industry average in Michigan there. And we looked at the data, you know, in headset, and it and it it totally holds water. Uh, it's for sure the case. What do you think it is? Is it just that focus on customers? Is it is it special genetics? Is it a combination of those things? Like what drives that? I think part of it is, you know, I used to, if you heard me, uh, and Emily's been on a couple of panels with me over the years, I used to almost provocatively say that there are no brands in cannabis. You know, that uh, I would say that, you know, our apothecarium in California, if there's a brand that, uh, you know, that we don't carry, we don't like I never worried. I was never worried about losing a dollar in sales because we didn't carry any specific uh, brand. And I sort of, you know, would say it in a provocative way and thinking that, you know, at some point in the future, they're going to matter. But they, but they didn't matter right now. And what happened as I got to know the gauge folks better and started going out there uh, often about, uh, you know, a year and a half or two years ago was that I realized that I was wrong because they had the foresight to uh, stalk the folks from Cookies about, you know, four or five years ago in order to get the uh, exclusive for Michigan, which they got. And what they did, which I thought was very smart, is they launched the Cookies product only in their own stores. And what that did was it served to pull people from, you know, distant lands, you know, far, far locations, you know, a couple hours away, people will drive from to go to a uh, Gage store or a cookies uh, dispensary, which Gage, you know, also operates. And what they do is since they're coming from far, they end up having bigger basket sizes because it's not like they're just stopping on their way home, you know, from work. Uh, and what it also did, which I thought was really, uh, you know, smart, uh, I'm not sure that I would have had the foresight, but what they did was they were able to build their own Gage brand in a, in a really uh, smart way by, you know, you get, uh, you get everybody to come drive from really far to buy cookies products and they buy lots of, uh, lots of cookies uh, product. But then when they're in the store, they would also, you know, throw some more stuff in their, uh, in their basket, including many of the, uh, the gauge uh, products. And people realized that the quality was, uh, was similar. The genetics were a little different because cookies has their own exclusive genetics. Gage also uh, launched their own exclusive genetics. Uh, but people would realize that that uh, they were of uh, similar quality and it was able to help by pulling people in for cookies. They were able to sell cookies and a lot more other stuff as well. So that's what I really sort of uh, my learning that I took away from being with the Gage folks. But then I also just realized over time that or, or right away when you would go into their stores is these guys and gals who uh, were running these uh, running this company, they just felt sort of cooler <laughs> than uh, sort of the rest of the uh, the rest of the industry or say a lot of the uh, other operators in, in the industry. I think part of it, you know, I just felt like they were, they seemed to me to be a little bit closer to the cannabis culture than say I was, or a lot of, you know, a lot of these management teams of a lot of these, you know, multi-state operators, they're, you know, uh, you know, uh, business people from, you know, uh, or you know, they're either, you know, from finance or from real estate or something like that. And or from uh, from uh, gaming where they didn't necessarily have, you know, they weren't necessarily that close to the cannabis culture. They were smart at seeing an opportunity that was that was out there and taking advantage of it. But I felt like in order for us to be able to compete in these limited market states where things were going to get more competitive, I felt like the closer we were to that cannabis culture and to be able to really sort of speak to the consumers, the, the better off that, that we would be. So that was sort of the driving force behind Gage. The other cool thing about Gage is it's an unlimited licensed state. So that is uh, sort of, you know, was one of the big no-nos, you know, for the last, uh, you know, couple of years. And we, you know, we had gravitated like many towards these limited licensed states, but what ended up happening was I feel like everybody sort of looked at Michigan and said, you know, we have bigger fish to fry, you know, in all of these East Coast states and all of that. So they sort of left that Michigan market 
to more of the, you know, the operators that were already there and a lot of the operators that took part in the caregiver market for, for years. And on top of that, there are no license caps in Michigan. So if you have a successful retail concept or you're a successful operator in Michigan, you could end up with, you know, you could have 200 dispensaries if you want to, which is, A, that's, you know, those are the kind of markets you don't want to enter as a second mover because the local operators, they know the market, they're going to know the market. It's going to be a home game for them and an away game for whoever comes in. But it was this huge, uh, you know, vibrant market where we felt like we were, we would be entering with one of the top players. And that was what was attractive to me was, you know, all the sort of uh, additional intangibles or, you know, in terms of helping us in our, in our other markets and being able to bring their, the Gage brand and the Cookies brand to other, uh, to other markets, but also that uh, we could continue to build out our presence in Michigan and there would be nothing that would really stop us from having, you know, a, you know an unlimited amount of dispensaries uh, over time. Yeah, I mean, something I never thought I'd say is that Michigan is like the California of the Midwest. And I think it's something I've admired about you and Tara Send is that you do endeavor into these highly competitive environments. And because it is a little bit of looking into the future of where these other markets will ultimately go, the timeline to when they get there, of course, will be constrained or alleviated based on the regulatory shifts. But I think it's very smart to look at what it's like to be in these proving ground markets where you have to compete and really think about brand and retail strategy because those are your moats. And so uh, one of the things I, you know, Morgan, I think is listening, but, you know, I was like, I was like, I think Gage is kind of, to your point about the cool factor is a little bit, and Cy and I have talked about this, is a little bit of like the supreme of the cannabis retail brand, where it's like kind of focusing on culture and coolness. And and when we were in New York, Morgan was like, what store is everyone lined up? I was like, that's supreme. That is what people do. And so that is when things get more competitive. So one of the things I've, I've always been wanting to pick your brain a little more on is you do have these two really strong tent poles of retail brands. You have Apothecarium, which is, by the way, anyone who's newer to the sector, Apothecarium was really like a landmark brand in California. I'd say Apothecarium and Spark were two of the retail concepts that really defined where we've headed with uh, retail experience and cannabis. But then, so you've brought that to New Jersey and then you have the Gage brand. And so I'm curious how you're thinking about these different retail strategies and, and where they'll live in the portfolio as you go after your consumer segments. Absolutely. We've obviously thought about it a lot. And this is where we've come down in states like Michigan. Like I would never want to change the gauge uh, retail, you know, uh, have Gage be the batter for uh, our retail because there we can, you know, like I said, get to an unlimited amount of dispensaries. And that is going to be the bulk of our business in Michigan. We'll be selling products through our own stores. There's no better spokespeople for your products than you know, your own bud tenders in your own stores. If you're selling through somebody else's dispensary, they're not going to, uh, they're not necessarily going to be as, uh, you know, uh, a positive on the products that you are in your own stores. So in a state like that, like in Michigan with unlimited caps, where we're not going to need to do a whole lot of wholesale business or the majority of it's going to be retail, then, you know, we're going to keep the gauge store as the, as the banner there. But in other states like Pennsylvania and New Jersey and, and Maryland, there, there where the uh, opportunity is not unlimited on the retail side, because, you know, New Jersey, you can only have three dispensaries. In Pennsylvania, you can have up to 18. We have, we have six right now. But in order to achieve our best potential from a revenue and profitability point of view in those states with limited caps on dispensaries, then we feel like Gage is a great product brand, but the dispensaries all around the state are not necessarily going to want to uh, carry the Gage brand if they're also competing with a gauge uh, dispensary across the street from them, it would be like, you know, uh, Constellation opening up a, you know, a Corona beer store across the street from, you know, from the supermarket. So in those states, and I'm oversimplifying it all a little bit, but in those states, we are going to keep the uh, apothecary uh, brand as our retail batter. It also has a little bit to do. It aligns also with these are earlier states. They're, you know, uh, sort of uh, like you mentioned Michigan as being like the California of the Midwest. Michigan is a more sophisticated cannabis market with people that have more knowledge of cannabis than they do in, you know, say, New Jersey or, or Pennsylvania. The apothecarium 
which, you know, uh, Emily, you know, uh, you know, I agree with you about, uh, you know, them being sort of leaders in the space. They were the first really nice dispensaries. And it's funny because anytime I ever bring up the, you know, uh, the apothecary, I never have to like hold my breath and be like, uh, oh, yeah, I know them. That's not they're not that good or whatever it is. They've always even on the on the East Coast uh, as well, where we've opened them. It's a, it's this great uh, retail experience, but it is very uh, it is also for a market for markets on the East Coast that are less sophisticated, where people need more counseling. That's what the apothecary is also known for, that they really, you know, take the time to educate their uh, their consumers. So that's another reason where the apothecary and banner uh, and sort of retail concept works better in these earlier markets versus in Michigan. People know their cannabis really well. They don't sort of need as much uh, of the counseling. And it's more about having this awesome, you know, cool retail concept. The competition angle that you mentioned, like a store, you know, selling, you know, your own products and then other brands in like that dynamic. I mean, it is interesting how that that is like something quite unique to cannabis. And you see it more and more. But over time, do you think that that's just going to be untenable? Do you think it's going to be too hard to carry like the competitive products we see it where you're vertically integrated and you're still you're selling you know to other stores like like the apothecarium stores in um in new jersey you know have rhythm which is a gti product and so on is that just going to be like the way that the industry is for a long long time or do you think it's going to shift to more traditional like cpg retail channels yeah, I'm not sure. I guess the way I look at it is, you know, right now we are, you know, and I always sort of use analogies uh, in the pharmaceutical space because, the, yeah, you know, what do they say? Like every hammer, uh, you know, I, it's I, like I'm, I'm sort of, yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. So maybe I look at everything through pharma, but it's like right now we're sort of we're CVS and Walgreens and we're Pfizer or, or Merck as well. So. And in my view, you know, in these places where, you know, we are, we're pretty much vertically integrated everywhere other than the other Maryland. So in that case, I don't want to sort of uh, shortchange being the best retailer that we can possibly be. And like I was saying with uh, cultivation and manufacturing that, you know, we have to be singly focused on what customers and patients want. I feel like it's similar as a retailer. We also, we need to be singly focused on what customers and patients want in order to build the best loyalty to our retail stores. And to me, that means uh, supplying that store with products only based upon focusing on what customers want, not what we want to uh, sell in our stores in order for us to drive the best margins for ourselves. And I think that that, personally, I feel like that will drive the most loyalty to our retail stores uh, you know, in the near term and in the long term. So, so I think that, you know, I would envision, you know, over the long term that we will always carry other people's products or other companies' products because that's what customers want. Like, I'm not going to be arrogant enough to say that we, you know, uh, have all of the best SKUs in every market where we are, that they should only be buying our products. You know, there's lots of awesome products out there like, you know, uh, GTIs, vapes and, and, and all the rest. So... I think that that is how we build the, the best loyalty to our uh, stores. It also helps you learn and know what, what right. customers want, you know? Right. I mean, that's not too dissimilar from, you know, uh, traditional retail having private label where, you know, they, you know, they don't, maybe they don't distribute that to other competitive retailers, but they're still, you know, competing on the floor against other brands that they're carrying at the same time, you know, they're selling those brands. Cause you know, if you go to a, I don't know, a, a Target store or something, or even Costco, right? They've got Kirkland brand, but they also sell, you know, competitive products. So that the consumer wants a variety. So I think that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And one thing I would add, Sai, also, is in undersupplied markets, you actually unlock a lot more revenue and profitability if you do carry other people's stuff. Say in New Jersey or in Pennsylvania, if you can only make X, which is you're going to have demand if you're selling to other stores as well. If you're going to have demand in excess of that, then the more third-party product that you sell through your store, that actually frees up some more product for you to sell to the wholesale market. So you actually end up grabbing on an absolute basis more revenue and more profits by carrying uh, other company stuff in, in your stores. Yeah, that's that's an interesting angle Great to point. it. You get, 
capture more market share by, mm -hmm. by freeing up some of that availability there. Mm -hmm. um, I want to touch on Michigan a bit, you know, since that's kind of a top of mind market for everyone this year. It's one of those temple markets for 2022. Everyone's really excited, you know, of, of it coming online. You mentioned, you know, February 22nd. I know there was that 180 day window that they announced. So like legally, cannabis sales are supposed to start by February 22nd. I mean, we're a month out from that now. Not looking good, is it? It's not looking great. It doesn't seem like there needs, they're going to implement a metric which I don't believe will be implemented in time. It usually takes, I know the contract was signed a couple of weeks ago by the state with metric, and that usually takes at least 60 days. You would probably know better than, better than me, but that's one reason there's just, we're, we just don't know. There's still big holes in the regulation. We don't even know exactly what we're gonna be able to sell and what packaging we'll be able to use. I can tell you we're ready from a, uh, you know, from an inventory perspective, like I said, we've got thousands of pounds of flour and uh, we got, you know, a whole lot of uh, vapes and and uh, and all the rest, but there's just a little bit too much still that's unknown that uh, makes us uh, you know pretty sure that it's not going to kick in starting uh, February 22nd. The other thing is there needs to be a 30 day notice period from the regulator in New Jersey, and unless we get it here in the next three or four hours, it looks like uh, that in and of itself would make it so that February 22nd could not start. I'm still hopeful that it'll be sometime, uh, you know, within the within the first quarter, you know, and, and to me, whether it starts on February 22nd or it takes another month or two, it doesn't change the long term right. value of uh, of these businesses. But, you know, we've been waiting for this for, uh, you know, for a year and a half or so. And we're just uh, we're just sort of chomping at the bit. And we're really uh, excited to show New Jersey residents, you know, more of them, not just the medical patients, what how good our products are and launching the cookies brand uh as I may have mentioned, that we have the exclusive in, cook, uh, in Jersey for, for cookies. We're excited to, uh, to you know, show everybody we, what we can do there. Uh, and it really has the ability for us to really, you know, over double the size of our business pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, that, that's great. And yeah, New Jersey, it's not like it's a surprise, right? Here we are in 2022. We've known about this for months and months. We had that six-month window. And I know, like, even the, the other retail licenses that are, you know, going to be issued, uh, I don't think those are happening until March of this year. So even w if it were to come online in February, I feel like probably going to see some supply constraints or just access is going to be relatively limited. There's all these municipalities that opted out. Yeah, I, I also read that they opted out in a lot of, lot of reason to um, to just kind of postpone it so they could make some decisions around, you know, what the framework looks like because they could opt in later. But yeah, it just sounds like, I guess we'll wait and see. But at some point this year, hopefully that market comes online. It's good. Yeah, I'm pretty sure of that. I mean, I've, you know, I've seen crazier yeah. things happen, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that it's going to, you know, it's going to happen uh, at some point this year. And, you know, uh, and, I, and I think uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. And then there are another set of licenses that were awarded a couple of months ago from, I think, the 2019 application round. But those uh, licenses are actually not uh, allowed to sell into rec until they mm -hmm. sell, uh, until after they've sold into medical for one mm -hmm. full year. So, you know, so the real focus of, uh, of the state, which rightly so, has been they want to make sure that there's enough product for medical patients. You know, mm -hmm. at this point, we've got, uh, we probably have, uh, you know, uh, 20 or 30 times in our vault what we need to supply medical patients. Uh, and I know a lot of the other operators are in the same position as us. So, you know, we're excited to get going. I don't know, you know, that the rec market is going to be so abundantly uh, supplied with, uh, you know, an unlimited amount of product. But uh, we know that, you know, us and, and at least four or five of the other operators I know in New Jersey have been going full speed for the last year and change. And there's going to be, you know, a lot of product to uh, satisfy. First of all, medical market fully satisfied. But even beyond that, uh, I think we're going to see, you know, this has a potential to be over a billion dollar market uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, I outside of the opening of Illinois call, or New Jersey is the one I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly excited to see as kind of a follow on to how exciting that market was when it opened. So yes, absolutely. It's very similar because it's also there's going to be a limited amount of dispensaries at the start, say between 25 and 30, which is going to produce some crazy numbers like what you saw in uh, Illinois, where there were dispensaries that were doing over $50 million in sales. But also, 
we have been talking internally. We do need more dispensaries to be coming on over time because at some point you hit your upper limit of what you can sell if the state is sort of understored. You know, that sort of seems like the, the narrative of what's going on in Illinois right now with, with them not coming on with these new stores. But I think we're going to be in good shape there because you've got to figure the licenses that were given out a few months ago, they should be able to open towards the second half of this year once they get their year in of, uh, of medical uh, you know, figure, uh, you know, second half of next year, those will be coming on as buyers of the uh, adult use product. Well, I hope, um, Sai and I wanted to get out there for the opening day, so maybe we could come to one of your stores for, uh, for the opening day and uh, see what's going down. Ab- absolutely, absolutely. We will definitely invite you uh, out for opening day, and we're open- we'll be opening up that third dispensary I mentioned in uh, Lodi, New Jersey, right next to the famous... Uh, uh, and we share the parking lot with the famous uh, Bada Bing from uh, Bada Bing. Uh, <laughs> uh, Maybe. We'd love to have you out for that one. Uh, that's opening soon, so it will probably be just a medical uh, opening for medical. But we would definitely uh, love to uh, to have uh, you know uh, anybody that would like to come out for uh, for that opening. We'd love to have you. Anything to to go see the Bing. I'm into yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Well, Jason, thanks so much for joining. Uh, this was really great. Great to hear all about everything going on with Terrison, everything going on in the world of cannabis here. And yeah, hopefully we can catch up soon with New Jersey opening and hopefully that's yeah sooner than later. And uh, thanks everyone for listening and tuning in uh, in this first Twitter spaces experiment here. Really appreciate it. We're figuring this out. So we'll feel like how we can take questions in the future and things like that. Uh, but really want to thank everyone for joining. And uh, if you enjoy uh, the the recording here, be sure uh, to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, leave us a review. It really helps out. And uh, more great stuff coming up this year. Uh, we've got some big plans. So stay tuned for all of that. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This was fun. I could have gone another, uh, another couple hours. Well, next time we'll book two hours. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's do it. Thanks for listening to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset. For more information on Headset, visit headset.io.